I am very happy to be here today. My name is Clark Halpern, and it is great to be hosted here by the Energy Policy Institute at the University of Chicago Career Series. And I'm here to talk to you a little bit about my career journey to international agriculture and climate uh, policy. Um, but first, as we dive in, I'd like to talk a little bit more about what work I'm doing right now. And then later in the presentation, I'll tell you a little bit about my journey to get there. And so I always like to use this graph in my presentations. It's by the World Meteorological Organization, and it's global temperature change from 1850 to 2019. And without any legends, without any other information, it's very easy to understand that the temperatures have changed, climate change is real, and I, I've used this previously in the past for very successful um, extension work in trying to describe the changing world that we live in. And so for those who are not uh, in the agriculture or environment or climate change world, um, I just like to give a little current state of this uh, in that agriculture is responsible for up to 29% of global greenhouse gas emissions. In this uh, livestock, is one of the primary causes for the amount of food that it produces, where it produces about 13% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Despite this massive emissions, uh, roughly 10% of the world is currently malnourished. And there is 900,000 people currently in famine conditions. Um, this sense of inequality um, also is uh, continues into the fact that the top 10% of the world emit about 50% of global greenhouse gas emissions, while the bottom 50%, um, most of the people who are currently malnourished, emit only 12% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And we see that climate change is already and is projected to be one of the main drivers of global hunger. And so to try to convey this sense of the world that we're living in, I went and I pulled a couple of news headlines for the past month. And it's very clear, um, both from these news headlines and from all of the reports that, especially since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, we are progressing the wrong way when it comes to global hunger. Um, some of these uh, headlines, the US Envoy says that U.S. is doing all it can to avert Somali famine. Uh, India's nutrition, uh, nutritional deficiency, a hidden hunger race. Uh, there may not be enough food for everyone in 2023. Uh, how Russia's war on Ukraine is worsening global starvation. UN agency warns of record rates of hunger in Syria. Global food crisis putting millions of lives at risk. And are we staring at a potential global famine? And these are alarming. These are uh, horrible headline street. It's a very difficult state of the world that we're currently in. Um, it is global hunger, climate change. These are truly wicked problems, problems that don't have an easy solution. There's no, you know, one size fits all response. And there's a lot of effort and work that needs to be done in pushing us into the right direction. Um, but with this, there are a lot of people who are working on this globally. And so I pulled a couple of my you know, favorite groups that are working on it um, for the World Food Program, who recently won the uh, Nobel Peace Prize to the One Acre Fund, an NGO that I think is doing fantastic work, um, along with countless other NGOs, IGOs, governments, and community organizations. Um, but I have had the honor of working for the past several years with the World Bank Group. And I thought it would be nice to give a brief description of the World Bank Group for those who are not very well, um, I don't know it very well, as I didn't know it very well when I was a UChicago undergrad. Um, so the World Bank Group is an intergovernmental organization uh, underneath the United Nations. So it's part of the United Nations. It's based in Washington, DC, but has offices in 130 locations around the world. It contains 189 member states and staff from about 170 countries. And it's one of the world's largest sources of funding and knowledge for developing nations. And the World Bank Group only has two 
main missions, and which seems very simple until you know what those missions are. Um, the first is to promote shared prosperity by increasing the incomes of the poorest 40% of people in every country and to end extreme poverty to, by reducing the share of global population that lives in extreme poverty to 3%. I went uh, yesterday and I pulled this map of World Bank projects. So this is all the nations in the world that currently have a World Bank project going on. And so um, of these member states, uh, about 75 of them work with one of the, the one of the parts of the World Bank group, the, um, the International Development Assistance, the IDA. And so these nation states qualify due to their low income status to have loans without interest or grants um, in order to provide governmental work for the people in their nation. For other nations that are of a higher income level, they work with the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the IBRD. Um, and that was the organization that I worked with for the several years that I was with the World Bank. Um, but now that we're done talking with the World Bank, um, let's talk about another IGO, the Intergovernmental Authority on Development. So it was formed in 1987. Um, it's a coalition of um, these member states, Djibouti, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Kenya, uh, Sudan, South Sudan, Somalia, and Uganda. It's, and there's about 230 million people that live in this part of the world. And so for my most recent project, the project that I worked with most at the World Bank, um, I was part of a World Bank partnership with the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, which all for the just brevity, I'll be referring to as EGAD, um, this, the acronym for uh, from now on. And the reason that I, an agriculture and climate specialist at the um, uh, analyst at the World Bank, was working with them is due to their uh, reliance on agriculture. So climate change in livestock is a uh, massive issue in this area. Uh, the EGAD region was, no, uh, was identified as one of the most vulnerable areas of the world um, to climate change. Uh, we can see that cattle, uh, it makes up about 10% of the world's cattle, 13% of the world's sheep and goats, and 50% of the world's camel. And for those who are not in the agriculture space, it's a little bit difficult to directly understand what these numbers mean or, or how important they are. Um, but for the arid and semi-arid lands of this region, which are very large, uh, most of the people living there earn about 95% of their income from livestock. So any impacts on livestock will have far-reaching effects for these countries. Uh, additionally, livestock is frequently traded throughout um, the region across international borders. And that's why, um, and that's why the EGAD region has such a focus on livestock in that they, re they require so much effort on maintaining coherence of transboundary movement of livestock. And especially one of the main works that they've done in the past is looking at veterinary diseases of livestock. Uh, and I, I, coming from a non-agriculture space, it's, it's a little bit difficult to understand why livestock is so important um, until you look a little bit more at the current situation. Uh, so for the past four years, there's been a drought, and this is very plainly caused by the climate change changing uh, the weather patterns in this region. Uh, the photo on the left was taken back in October. Uh, those are all dead animal carcasses in Somalia. Uh, and in February, and so this is uh, this graph on the right, is from the famine early warning system, and it is projected that uh, I'll, uh, part of Somalia will be in famine in February, and a large part of the region will be in emergency hunger conditions. And it is these points that it is why we need to take these problems seriously. Um, and this is why I had the, the honor of 
being able to spend my time working on this issue. Um, so as we look at this issue, it's not an issue that can only be solved in the short term, and um, but it also needs to be solved in the long term. And so while many organizations such as the World Food Program are focusing on these acute issues, these the, the, the famine that's occurring right now, I worked with the uh, EGAD um, to develop a strategy for sustainable and resilient livestock development in view of climate change. So from 2022 to 2037. And so this was the guiding, this is the guiding strategy for these member states for the next 15 years on how they plan to develop livestock, develop their agricultural system to respond to these effects of climate change uh, for the next 15 years. And this was quite a difficult project um, that we worked on uh, for numerous years. And I'd like to talk to you a little bit first about how we created it. Um, so to make it easy, I put it down into three main steps. Uh, first, we had um, multi-year stakeholder consultations with governments, resource organizations, farmers, pastoralists, pastoralists so those who move cattle um, or other livestock through arid and semi-arid lands typically, or other marginalized groups in each country. Additionally, we, uh, and I'm speaking as EGAD and the World Bank, um, we had extensive climate, economic, and policy modeling to determine the effects of various policy instruments that can be implemented in this region. And then finally, uh, we looked at what were previous successful country case studies um, for climate change adaptation, mitigation, resilience in the livestock sector that took place in one country that had the potential to upscale throughout the entire region. And what did we find in the end? Um, we found that there are five, uh, priority intervention areas that if enacted would go a long way in increasing the sustainability and the resilience of the livestock sector in view of climate change. Um, the first was mechanisms of climate risk management. So we looked at what financial, what you know, governmental mechanisms, what ecological mechanisms could we put in place to reduce the risk of climate change in the region. Next, we looked at the, nat um, the natural resource base in that many of the livestock here are reliant entirely on what the ecosystem can provide. Um, so the natural resource base. Um, so looking at how we can improve the ability of the natural resource base to provide for these livestock, but also look at what can the livestock do in terms of ecosystem service, in terms of carbon sequestration for the region. Um, for the third priority intervention area, we looked at livestock production. Um, and income diversification along the livestock value chain. Um, it's possible that in the future that not all of the people who are currently producing livestock will be able to produce livestock, but it's also possible that they diversify their income to other um, natural resource based. So looking at things such as fisheries, beekeeping, or other technical skills that can be learned. Um, then we zoomed out to look at the research, innovation, and knowledge management. So how can we encourage research organizations as well as traditional or indigenous knowledge um, to be shared throughout the region? And then finally, um, we looked at policy alignment, coordination and um, coherence for transboundary issues. So these points that I was referring to previously about how livestock moves frequently throughout these nations. And I realize I'm saying all these quite abstract ideas and uh, and tasks, but I'd like to talk to you a little bit about what my role was in this process. And so here's a photo for the strategy negotiation that took place earlier in uh, the last summer in Addis Ababa, um, Ethiopia. And so I am to the right of this photo. Um, I was one of three uh, World Bank negotiators at this um, event. And that was because I was working for the past several years as the World Bank representative to all these stakeholder consultations throughout this region. So I was uh, hearing from stakeholders from Somalia, from South Sudan, from Ethiopia, Kenya, Uganda, Djibouti, um, and Sudan. And it's all, and it's from that that we were able to write the strategy 
um, so that it was able to be brought here to the livestock ministers, environmental ministers, and various other um, governmental officials of these member nations so that they could agree and then bring it back to their country and have it signed into law. And this was a eye-opening experience. This was my first time working for this long at this scale and at this impact, um, as well as knowing that my work was going to have a massive impact for years. And with that, I wanted to just briefly share some of the most important skills that I needed um, at the World Bank. And the first was just, you needed to have multicultural navigation skills. You needed to be able to be put in a situation with people from very diverse backgrounds and still be able to navigate yourself through um, smoothly. Uh, additionally, it was required that you had a very broad and deep knowledge base uh, from economics and policy design to climate science and animal genetics. All these were highly relevant and important for the work that we were doing. And you needed to be able to be able to speak uh, with knowledge and care and precision about these subjects. And finally, um, something that is very important when you get into this type of work is the confidence to try to solve these wicked problems under the time pressure that is there, under the knowledge that they are currently affecting people. Um, there are people who are having malnutrition or famine who are dying uh, in all, in many parts of the world um, due to the interplay between agriculture and climate change and the hunger that it causes and to try to solve these wicked problems. And now that I've talked a bit about this, about my experience at the World Bank, I will just briefly go into my experience uh, of how I got there. And after that, I'll open it up to questions. Um, so for my personal career journey, I never thought I was going to end up at the World Bank. I never thought I was going to be working uh, you know, at this type of, at this, these, at this subject. Um, and so with that, I did not have a particularly linear career path. It, I went to numerous places. I worked on numerous different things. Um, I made a <laughs> map of the various places and times that I worked, and it was not very uh, quick or smooth to end up in the position that I am now. Um, but it all, in the end, a lot of this academic journey did start at UChicago. So I was a undergraduate from 2012 to 2016. Uh, in that I had, I got two degrees, a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Science and a Bachelor of Arts in Biological Science where I specialized in microbiology. Um, I worked for four years. I had a work study scholarship. So I worked for four years as a student assistant in an immunology laboratory, researching the connection between autoimmune disease and diet. And then I would spend my spring break as a ecological research assistant in the Sonoran Desert, um, where I had a lot of fun measuring the spines of, of saguaro cactuses and uh, looking for beetles. It was a, a great time and a nice break from the uh, between winter and spring quarters. Um, for my extracurriculars, I was a student government representative for the class of 2016. I helped to found a food magazine, The Palette, which I do not believe still exists as a uh, student organization. Um, but I was on the executive board of TEDx e Chicago, and then I was a member of the Geo Union Geophysical Sciences Club and a member of the Outdoor Adventure Club. And I really enjoyed being invited to come back and speak about my, my career journey and that it let me reflect a little bit about what I learned at UChicago and how that's helping me right now. And I narrowed it down to three main things. The first is just pure and simple time and knowledge management, how to prioritize tasks and quickly absorb information. And this was a hard fought from all the organic chemistry classes to then having to go to my social class on, you know, European history. Um, it was always a really uh, difficult time to get through undergrad at UChicago. 
Um, but looking back now, that was one of the most useful things in that now I'm confident I'll be able to take on and absorb uh, almost any subject if I needed to. Uh, then thinking on different scales, I at the, at the time did not enjoy having to switch between philosophy to atmospheric science to biochemistry. Um, but now looking back, being able to take these different perspectives at the same time and find these connections between different subjects is something that has really been invaluable in my current work. And then finally, the most important thing, and I think something that I'll carry with me for the rest of my life is just intellectual and professional curiosity, being able to think and wonder about what, what could be. And that had, was primarily from the research that I did. Um, and it was truly, and it's truly guiding my uh, current path right now. Um, but as I left UChicago, I was originally planning on going to medical school. I had taken the MCAT. I had written up all my medical school applications, um, but I was graduating the week before the medical school applications opened. And I was talking with all of my friends and they were going off to different places and different things. And I was taking a gap year to continue working in this immunology lab as my medical school applications went through. And I only felt that I was so jealous of them going off and exploring all these different countries, all these different cities, all these different topics. And I knew at that point that it wasn't, medical school wasn't for me, this type of linear career path wasn't for me, and that I had to take a step back and figure out what I wanted to do. And so after a year of continuing to work in this biomedical, this immunology research lab, I learned that you know, this type of molecular science also wasn't particularly for me. And I wanted to go out there and experience a different culture and a different uh, take on the world. And I had a deep interest in the effects of climate change on the environment. Um, I had a deep interest in food. And I thought, why not join, of course, then the Peace Corps? Uh, so I spent two years as a Peace Corps volunteer in Ghana. I lived in a small uh, rural village um, along the Black Volta River, um, which is roughly here uh, in Ghana, where I was an agricultural extension volunteer. And my primary task was to work with uh, getting grants and knowledge transfer to smallholder farmers in the area with a focus on women. And here I am on the uh, left with the chief of the Deg tribe, which was the tribe that I was situated with. Um, after a community event next to the Black Volta River. And I had uh, a wonderful time at points, a difficult time at points, but I did learn a lot. And one of the things that I was very happy that I had an experience with was actually not with the Deg tribe, but with the Fulani tribe, which are a pastoralist tribe that exists all through West Africa. And so I lived on the outskirts of town right next to the main camp of several Fulani tribe members. And so over the course of two years, I had the pleasure of becoming friends with them and learning a lot about pastoral uh, cattle raising. And that was one of the main points that got me into the career that I am now to see the how everyone can see the effects of climate change, the change in weather patterns. Um, but it's often points the government's response and support for farmers on the ground, that is the lacking, uh, the lacking point. And so as I was finishing up Peace Corps, I had really kind of been bitten by the bug of agriculture and climate change, and I wanted to continue down that path. Uh, and I ended up reading this article by National Geographic back in 2017 about this tiny country that feeds the world. Um, and so it's all about the Netherlands and the, the food output, which is just massive per capita. And in this, they reference what the future of farming could look like. And I was extremely excited about what people were talking about the future of farming. And they kept referencing this one university in the Netherlands, Wageningen University. And so I ended up getting a scholarship to go there. And I ended up getting a Master of Resilient Food and Farming Systems 
which was at that point called a Master of Organic Agriculture, as well as a Master of or, uh, Agroecology from the Institute Superior to Agriculture Rhone Alps, which is in Lyon, France. And this was a very exciting point to be all of a sudden surrounded by people who were also excited about agriculture, who were excited about this idea of food systems and climate change, and not only what the current situation was, but how can we move to a better future? And it was in my master's uh, studies here that I ended up having an internship at the World Bank office in Croatia, where I worked on agriculture and livestock policy projects in Eastern Europe in Central Asia. Um, and this was a wonderful experience. And it was from there that I gained the network that allowed me to continue as a World Bank consultant um, for this project with uh, the EGAD region over the past several years. Um, and now that I've uh, finished with this World Bank project, I am very happily transferred back to being a full-time PhD candidate at Wageningen University and Cornell. And there was this UN report that came out uh, earlier in the year, the FAO's Future of Food and Agriculture. And it warned that global food crises are likely to increase in the future without wider systematic change. And it's at this point that I find my niche for my research, my current academic research, in that I am studying what could be, you know, what is our potential food, uh, food systems of the future. And in this, I'm looking primarily at this idea of circular food systems where crop, uh, where food waste, crop residues, and various processing co-products are used to feed livestock, um, where no human edible food is used to feed livestock, and looking at what's the potential um, of this type of food system to support and feed our global population. And while I realize that this might not be the, the silver bullet solution or be able to solve this problem of global hunger. Uh, I find it very exciting to be able to envision this greener planet, this society where people are fed, this society where there is reduced inequality within the food system, um, and be able to take these steps backwards, look at what consumption changes, technological innovations, various policy or ecological practices that need to change and figure out how do we move from this world uh, to a better one. Um, so with that, I want to thank you all for your attention. Uh, I'd like you, if you'd like to, uh, please connect with me on LinkedIn. My name is Clark Halpern. Or if you'd like, uh, feel free to send me an email, uh, clarkhalpern at word.ml. Um, and with that, I will invite Sativa back uh, and we will open it back up for questions. Thank you so much. Excuse me, the sun has moved a little bit. But thank you so much. Um, while we wait for questions to um, sort of come in, um, I'd like to invite you to speak a little bit more about um, your uh, PhD and sort of the, the research you are doing, just sort of as we wait for some questions to trickle going. Of course. Um, so I've had the pleasure of moving into this space as it's gotten a lot of traction. Um, there's, uh, it's been, it's a new, this idea of circular food systems is being looked at as a way that we can reduce the ecological um, footprint of livestock. Um, and it's a way of looking out as a possible constraint for looking at what consumption changes that we need in the future. And so with that, I studied the economics and policy side of this. I'm fortunate enough to be part of a team that looks at all aspects of circular food systems from the nutrient management to the health side of things to the biodiversity impacts it might have. And I found my niche in economics and policy. And from that, we've built a computer model where it's possible to model these types of circular food systems on national or regional or greater scales um, to look at what is this possible, you know, we like to always refer to this lighthouse on the horizon of what a uh, world would look like if we had this type of agriculture. And of course, this requires heavily on different data sets from satellite data to consumption data to nutritional data sets, where it's look at what is feasible 
um, and we'll look at what is possible. And then we start moving back through the steps of what is feasible under the current system that we have. And my one of the main work that I'm doing is looking at what is the, the value of a circular food system when we start to take into the environmental and social um, prices and costs into account. And so when we compare that to a our current food system and look at you know what is the various opportunities that we can find where we can very easily transition to a more ecologically and socially positive food system. Could you speak a little bit more? It seems that um, your research and what you're studying is sort of really uh, positioned at um, the intersection of a lot of different fields. And so could you talk a little bit more about that and particularly for students who um, may be interested in something similar or are sort of interested in that interdisciplinary sort of work um, could you talk about that a little bit? I will happily talk about that because that was an issue that I personally had as a student in that I wanted to be able to, I took the maximum number of courses that I could over my four years at UChicago. I wanted to really learn and experience these different perspectives and often points as a undergrad you feel almost limited to this base knowledge, this uh, that that you're gaining. And looking back now, I wouldn't be able to be in the position that I'm in without having these very strong bases in environmental science and biological science. Um, and it was by then going out into the world and gaining real world experience that I was able to look at, okay, what is the direction that I want to go to? What's the direction that I want to go in from this point? And from there, be able to have the, the opportunity um, to pursue future education in that area. But I think if I, take, if I started off in doing a bachelor in policy or doing a bachelor's in economics, I would be in a radically different place than where I am right now. Um, just in that, I wouldn't have known that that was what I eventually wanted to end up doing. And it was only by taking this nonlinear route by able to really having all these different experiences that has given me the knowledge base that's needed to deal with these transboundary issues. Um, and so I think it, looking back now is just having the patience to be able to go through these different experiences and learn um, is was one of the most difficult parts of along this career journey, but in the end, most important part. Hmm. Um, and then I think we have a question. Um, so sometimes people who want to get engage in environmental research only think about um, large institutions such as the World Bank. Uh, do you have any recommendations on smaller or perhaps local research organizations um, or think tanks that graduate students can work with? That is a great question. Um, and I, I do agree that a lot of the weight is focused on work that's coming out of these larger institutions. Uh, but some of the most inspiring and some of the, for me, the most impactful work often comes from these smaller institutions. Uh, one that I'm thinking of right now that has had a lot of impact on my current work, it's called Seeds of a Good Anthropocene. And so look, it's looking at what communities around the world um, smaller research organizations or community organizations or just individuals have uh, have started to start promoting uh, in in essence the UN SDGs but you know what the what that means in their local context and this well I primarily have uh, gotten to know this from the view of food systems as well as uh, circular food systems there's many different uh, instances of that, um, of looking at it from a more environmental standpoint, um, that is truly exciting. And I think in the end, these local organizations, uh, they have the benefit of being able to truly dive deep within their, their local ecosystem and look at what are the factors at play. Um, but oftentimes that makes it viewing it from a global perspective and trying to find these points of you know exciting work much more difficult and so it does take a lot of patience in diving deep and trying to find these these exciting exciting people in these exciting moments 
Do you have any um, sort of recommendations where students um, can look uh, to find opportunities or sort of like what they should keep an eye out for? One of the, uh, the things that has actually driven me the furthest in my career is uh, volunteering work. Um, and so trying to find organizations that you think are interesting or that are doing um, good work and look at, you know, and if it's not possible to volunteer with them, look at what organizations they're associated with. Uh, I, uh, several years ago, got connected with this group, the Climate Smart Agriculture Youth Network, which is a, uh, it's a youth organization primarily based in Africa, and it's uh, headquartered in Cameroon. And I attended a session of theirs, and I thought, this is exciting. They are driving knowledge and funding to rural youth um, who want to promote uh, climate smart agriculture or look at agriculture as an exciting career opportunity rather than a uh, more difficult career path. Um, and so I've been volunteering with them for several years and most and a lot of the opportunities and insights that I've gotten throughout the course of my PhD has been actually through this volunteering work. And so while I don't have any you know, site in mind or something like that of where I can direct these, these Chicago students to, I think it's really important to put yourself out there in the space that you're interested in attend seminars, you know, and with this, uh, after COVID, it's been, you know, great to see the, all of these online sessions, including this one, as I'm calling in from the, the Netherlands, mm -hmm. uh, where knowledge can be shared across borders. And for me, it's uh, great to see some exciting, uh, all the exciting work that's being done and try to figure out how can you contribute to that work. All right. Um, I think that's it on questions. Um, and I don't have anything else. Do you have any sort of like last, last <laughs> words? I, I think it's, uh, I think in the end, you just need to be patient with your own career, but be excited about all the exciting things that you can contribute to. Um, so. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, also for joining. Yes. Great. Thank you.